I want to preface this video by saying that this is actually a video that's going to be about programming and also I wanted to say that um, this is my first video on programming and it's basically just going to be a slideshow but in the future I intend to make them a little bit more interesting so that you're not just having to watch me read a bunch of text off of the screen. This video in particular is going to be about a concept called multiple dispatch and I want to talk about this from sort of the perspective of single dispatch object oriented languages and these are the ones that you see most of the time um, like Java, C Sharp, uh, C++ to an extent. You know the big big kahunas all seem to use this one paradigm and implementing what we call multiple dispatch in these languages can be very tricky as it kind of defies the basic principles on which these languages are based. And lastly, I'm going to go ahead and, and label this as like an intermediate concept. If you're new to programming, you can probably pass on this, you'll be fine. Um, but if, you're, if you've been programming for a little while or even for a long time and you haven't looked at this topic in particular, then I think this uh, video might be for you. And even if you have, um, I mean, it's always worth hearing other people's opinions on the topic. And I'd, I'd love to hear back from people who have actually studied this themselves and, and you know, get some kind of feedback. Okay, so um, we'll start off with, with talking about what multiple dispatch actually is. And in order to do this, we'll look at the two words that make up the phrase multiple dispatch. Um, and the first one is, we'll talk about dispatch a little bit more in a minute, but, but the first word is multiple. And in order to more clearly understand what we mean by multiple, it can be insightful to look at the case where we have just a single dispatch happening. And I have on the slide here an example of that. We have an abstract object called animal and we call a speak method on it. Now calling the actual method is part of the dispatch that we'll talk about in the next slide. But what we need to see here is that we have a single type. We have a single abstract type. In this case, it's an animal, which may have a base class probably called animal as well. And um, we're going to actually resolve the method based on this one type. And that's the key. We're using one type here. So for example, if the underlying type were a dog and we called the speak method, it may bark. Whereas if it were a cat, it might meow instead. But suppose that instead of just having a single type, we actually want to see how two animals interact together. You know, if you put two animals into a cage, are, are they going to fight? Are they going to be friendly with one another? You know, what's going to happen? And this is what we mean by multiple when we talk about multiple dispatch. Now, in a single dispatch language, there's usually no sort of way to do this. Some languages will have extensions, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But how I imagine it might look is shown here on the slide, where if we have two animals, we might have animal one and animal two, and we want to call a method based on the underlying type of both of those animals. So to use a concrete example, if we had, say, a dog and a cat, and we put them together and we called the speak method, there may be fighting noises. But if we had two cats and we put them together, there may be like a purring noise or something. And if we had two dogs and we put them together, there may be some kind of like uh, playful noises whenever the speak method were, were called in this case. Okay, and the second word is uh, dispatch. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this particular topic because as we go through the code examples, we'll be literally performing the dispatch ourselves. So I just want to say that this um, dispatch that happens in these object-oriented languages is often implemented via a virtual method table. And these, these tables of function pointers are often called dispatch, are dispatch tables. And so that's where the word dispatch comes from, when we're using multiple types to dispatch into a function at runtime. But like I said, you can read what's here on the slide. If you don't understand how virtual method tables work, then you should definitely go check it out. It's some interesting stuff. But ultimately, we're about to go through the whole process anyway. So we'll just go ahead and move on and check out the code to um, to maybe get a better understanding of how you would do this without objects and then how you might go about doing it with objects. And now we're getting into the actual code and before I even do that I want to just say have a quick word about the, the code itself. Um, 
this example is a little bit less abstract than the animal example, um, although that's perfectly valid. Sort of the canonical example for multiple dispatch is that of video games and collision detection in video games. I mean, I'm assuming most people have played a video game at some point, and there are a variety of entities roaming around in video games, you know, the players, the enemies, the power-ups, and whatnot. And whenever these things collide with each other, you typically want to call code based on the type of the things that have collided with each other. So since that is kind of the canonical example, I'll stick with it here. And then these examples will have sort of like video game themed um, code snippets here. And also, just so you know kind of where I'm headed with this, um, we're actually going to start kind of from a completely procedural, non-object-oriented perspective, and then we'll gradually kind of clean up that code and then go into object-oriented programming just to see kind of a, the variety of different ways that you can go about doing this. And I also want to say before I get started um, that there are arguments to be made for each of these methods. There's not necessarily a best way to go about doing this. So keep that in mind as we go through each of the examples. To start off, we're going to use um, the probably the most well-known strictly procedural programming language uh, at the moment, which is just C. And uh, you know, generally you won't be restricted to the things that you are in C these days because pretty much everything is going to have some kind of functional or object-oriented way of going about doing things. But it can still be insightful to kind of figure out how it might have been done in C, how the multiple dispatch was sort of handled in C. And um, there's no reason you can't use these approaches in your object-oriented languages, for example. I mean, sometimes they may make more sense. Um, but basically what we have here at the top is we've defined a couple of constants for a player, an enemy, and an extra life. And we actually have to associate that constant which, with each of the entities that we make. And then later on when we call our collide function, we actually have to check each of these IDs. So we figure out, okay, the first, first ID, if it's a player, then we'll go ahead and downcast to the player, and then we'll check the second ID, and then if, it, if it's another player that it ran into, then we'll go ahead and call you know, the code that's relevant to two players colliding with one another. And you have to do this for every possible combination. And it's typically, you know, you can typically implement it with a big switch statement, but you have to keep in mind that this can get out of hand uh, very quickly. In this case, we have only three entities in a game, which will give us nine cases to handle. But if we had, say, for instance, 20 entities in the game, then we would have 400 cases to handle. But for situations where you know that there aren't going to be that many uh, entities floating around, this may be an ideal solution, although you should be very careful when choosing it. One way to clean up switch statements, and this is more of just a general sort of transformation that you can do whenever you're faced with a situation in which you have a bunch of nested switch statements, is you can actually make it uh, more data-driven by taking your various branches and populating the matrix with them. And that's what this code actually attempts to show. And this kind of harkens back to the dispatch that I was talking about earlier. We literally are going to construct a table that will call a method based on the IDs of each of the entities in the game. The code is a little bit different here. It was, it was written separately, but the idea is you have, we still have an ID for each of our um, our entities, you know, we've got like a princess, a hellspawn, and a bucket. Don't ask me why. I have no idea why I wrote this code this way. Um, but what we'll end up doing is we'll make a, you can see in our do collision function, it actually takes three arguments, including a table. Um, and collision here is just a function pointer to a, a collision function. So we have a table populated with a bunch of function pointers, and we'll index into that table based on the two types that we have. And as you can see here, the, you know, the code to set up the table is a little bit cluttered, but once the table is set up successfully, all we need to do is pass it around to wherever it's needed, and the collision function becomes very simplified because of that. We just pass in the two entities, pass in the table, and if we ever need to actually go in and update the um, the collision table for any reason, we simply update it where it's initialized and then continue passing the table around instead of having to go to every single place that a collision could happen and editing you know, some big switch statement. And this brings us to doing double dispatch in a single dispatch object-oriented language. 
One of the big problems with the way that we did it in C is that we basically had to manually generate a jump table or a dispatch table. And when we did that, we actually are reproducing what the compiler does automatically for us in a single dispatch object oriented language. Only a single dispatch object oriented language can't do multiple dispatch by default. So the goal is to try and avoid having to use those IDs in our actual code. You could do that in an object-oriented language, but since it already kind of generates the jump tables for you, we want to see if we can leverage that in order to actually implement multiple dispatch without having to manually track all of these IDs for all of the objects in the game. Now, I'm going to say this, and I know literally nobody will be interested in doing this, but one thing you could do, maybe after you finish watching the video, is you can sit down and try to think about how you might go about solving this problem. And by that I mean, like, how would you go about implementing a collision detection system like this for a game or whatever? And it turns out, you know, spoiler alert, it's very difficult and it really is very hard to come up with a system that can conform to object-oriented principles that make sense. I mean, think about it. In this example, from the code that we have on the screen, we're going to have a player and we're going to have an enemy and potentially an extra life floating around. In an object-oriented language, all of the properties, all of the, you know, data and all of the methods that act on that data are bundled together with an object. So if we have a player, the various player attributes might be bundled with it, and the same with an enemy, as well as, you know, the methods that the enemy might use. But how do we actually, like, where do we even put a function that deals with both a player and an enemy. It's actually a really difficult problem to solve and if you have some sort of collide method on a player that also is supposed to be colliding with an enemy, is it really the player's responsibility to determine what the enemy does? I mean it doesn't even really make sense when you think about it. So it's actually a very difficult problem to solve within the confines of a single dispatch object oriented language but luckily people have come up with this sort of solution which at its core involves sort of um, a part of a technique borrowed from the visitor pattern. So if at any point during my explanation of this code you get confused, go ahead and go and try to check out some examples of the visitor pattern. Now, I do have to say that the visitor pattern is meant to address a totally different well, maybe not a totally different, but a significantly different problem that's a little bit more specific than just general multiple dispatch or double dispatch. Um, but the mechanism sort of at the core of it is identical. It's, it's the same exact mechanism, which can be a little bit confusing. So if you're confused by the way the code reads, just be sure to go and check that out and maybe try to implement some code on your own to see if you can kind of figure out what's going on. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that if you come across a problem like this where you need to be calling functionality based on the types of two different objects and you don't really recognize it as a multiple dispatch problem, it can lead to a lot of problems. Whenever I first came across um, this exact example, it was actually collision detection for a game. I was so confused about what to do, I basically just stalled out. But I know that some programmers will just you know, keep on trucking through and they'll come up with some sort of half-baked solution that'll end up hurting them. But anyway, on to the code. Um, the code is actually, you know, at least I find it to be very tricky in the way that it works. Um, you know, you're passing this pointers around to objects and you've got all these different various collide methods and um, it can be difficult to follow and difficult to understand, but if you do sit down and understand it and then kind of trust in the mechanism that's going on, it actually, it actually ends up working out and it's really interesting and I feel like it's a pretty clean solution in the end. But basically what ends up happening here is we have some, in this case it's a free function or it could be, you know, a static function if you're in C Sharp or Java or something. Um, but I've called it completely abstract here just to kind of drive home the point that we'll be calling this function with two entities. And it, it's not associated with any kind of object. We just send in two abstract base classes, two entities, and then magically we'll actually end up calling the correct code. And the way this works is first our first entity, let's just for the sake of example say that it was a player. Okay, our first entity will have a collide method that will take in an entity itself. 
and then this collide method and you can see the code right here toward the middle of the screen will actually call the function that just takes in the generic entity itself now we've established now that entity one is a player we're actually in the player class calling a collide function from the player class now we take the entity that we've passed in we don't know what that is it's just some entity and we call its collide method and pass the player again we know that it's a player now we pass the player to it and then the same thing happens again on the object that we call that collide method on so for instance now if we are colliding with another player we know that we have a player and so we send this player to the players collide function and it will call the collide function with both of the entities so we know that one will be a player and the other will be a player as well and now we can call a function which will cause the two players to interact themselves this is a very complicated thing so I do suggest that you go out and try to find some code or write some code I have some code provided I have this exact code provided in the link to this video so you can go ahead and look at it and see how it works and try and figure it out because this part of it is difficult to wrap your head around but once you do I feel like the results are pretty compelling now again this isn't the end of the world this isn't like the solution there are a lot of other solutions and we'll talk about sort of the pros and cons very quickly in the next slide but this is definitely a technique that I like and probably the one that I prefer by default okay and I actually I made a mistake here I guess we're gonna look at the alternatives first but in addition to the you know the techniques that we've seen so far um, introspection is big a lot of people like to talk about introspection uh, I'm not a big fan of this particular solution it's not that bad honestly I mean I, I might use it you know so if, if you ever see me use it don't point your finger at me and yell at me because of it but the idea is you can use um, sort of the introspection features that you might have in your language in order to create the jump tables that we created earlier and that removes the need to track the um, the IDs of each of the entities in the game for example each of the the types don't need to have some sort of integer identifier with them instead you just use introspection to figure out what the types are and then create your jump table based off of that and certainly there are you know some advantages to doing it that way I still prefer the object oriented solution by default um, but you can definitely check out that sort of method and, and figure out if you like it or not. Also, there's language sp specific libraries and features. So like Lisp is, is, for whatever reason, it's widely known to have just built into the language multiple dispatch. So if, you know, your language luckily supports it, then you're golden. Um, I think Python has some wrapper libraries to do multiple dispatch. C Sharp has the dynam dynamic keyword. Um, for C++, I haven't actually investigated this myself, but I've read that the Loki library can somehow do multiple dispatch. Um, anyways, the point is you should definitely look into your own language and the extensions and libraries and different things to see if there's maybe a better solution. Because even though, you know, I've presented a number of solutions and I obviously have my, my kind of favorite Still, I would rather just use some other kind of solution if it's built into the language rather than rely on a really convoluted pattern or some nasty jump tables and identifiers or even introspection. Okay, and then I wanted to talk about some criticisms of these sort of approaches that uh, I've talked about. And first of all, I want to just sort of blanket address all of them at once. And this is something that really drives me nuts whenever I'm uh, checking out you know all the blogs and listening to what people have to say about this particular topic but if you need multiple dispatch you really just need multiple dispatch and I think the example of collision detection in games is a perfect example and like I said before in the video it's the canonical example and I think there's a good reason for that if you have a bunch of objects in a game that may potentially collide with one another you need to address all of those cases and you need to do it in a way that's sort of like not associated with any of the particular objects inside the game so I just wanted to kind of mention that like before I get into all of the specifics here that I don't feel like really there are very many valid criticisms of trying to solve this multiple dispatch problem like I there just aren't other solutions people haven't come up with other better solutions when you're talking about programming in a single dispatch object oriented language 
Um, so uh, the first one here is the open closed uh, violations. Obviously, if you've got a class that changes, like it has to change every time another object is added to the game, it doesn't make a lot of sense from a object oriented programmer's point of view. You know, I mean that's like red flags and alarm bells all over the place whenever your player class has to change every time you add a new enemy to the game. But ultimately when you're talking about something like collision detection, your player just has to know what it's going to collide with and that's just in my opinion, that's just the way that it works. You can factor out um, a lot of the code so that it's not as devastating to the rest of the code in the program, but ultimately there's still going to be some sort of open closed um, violation even if you do isolate it. Um, another common complaint I see is overcomplication. I think that this is specifically in cases where people misdiagnose their problem. They think that maybe they need to have some complicated, you know, mechanism in order to deal like the visitor pattern for example you see this a lot with the visitor pattern people think they need a visitor pattern when they really don't and then somebody else comes up with a better solution and the idea is that immediately the visitor pattern is useless and moot because in this one particular situation somebody used it inappropriately and it was shown to have a, a easier solution using some other approach and then um I see a lot of complaints about rapid code growth, and this has to do with sort of the exponential growth of the functions needed to handle the interaction of the different types. But ultimately, a lot of those can be short and sweet and defer to other code. But I think in general, you would want to have that many. I mean, you definitely, in a game, you want to consider every time two objects might interact with one another. And if you've got, you know, 40 objects, and you just have to deal with every single case, and that's just the way life is. So. In general, I, I have not found a lot of criticisms of the various approaches to multiple dispatch that I found to be re really even valid, but be sure to let me know if, um, if you've come up with any other solutions that I've not really presented here, or how you might go about dealing with these sorts of cases, because I'd really like to know. And uh, anyways, that wraps up this video. It's gone on long enough here, so I won't uh, spend too much time on the outro here, but be sure to leave feedback. I would love to hear any kind of feedback about how I might um, make these videos better. And also I apologize um, for the length and also the sort of lack of clarity. I have been um, a blog post that I have and I have linked that in the description as well along with the code for um, some of the, the slides that I've had here. And uh, I, you know, initially I had a very long blog article that was maybe like six times longer than the one that I've linked, and I just am not sure how to address this topic in a clear and concise fashion. Um, but let me know if I need to go into any more detail on any of the in particulars, and I, you know, like maybe for instance a V table or um, the visitor base sort of dispatch method. I can go through uh, step by step more carefully in another video if necessary. But anyways, thanks for watching.